Day each April provides us with the opportunity to pause and take a look at the world around us. As part of the library's celebration of Earth Day 2021, Maria Carrillo and I are going to share with you the background of some of Redland's early parks as well as tree planting festivities. If you have questions during the course of the presentation, please submit them using the Q&A button in the meeting toolbar on your screen. We'll do our best to get to them at the end of the program. For those who are familiar with Redlands at any point in the last, say, 80 years, you know it's a beautiful community with lovely trees, enchanting parks, and well-maintained front yards. But the landscape we know has literally grown over more than 125 years. For those who came in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, the East Valley was largely undeveloped California chaparral. It was these pioneers and those who followed who worked to transform the landscape into what a 1914 publication called the Radiant Garden Spot of California. Now you're probably thinking the Smiley Twins again, but the story of twin brothers Albert and Alfred Smiley and their impact on the evolution of Redlands cannot be overestimated especially when it comes to the natural environment. At Mohonk and Minnewaska in New York, these brothers saw the landscape as their canvas and trees, bushes, and flowers as the paints on their palette. Having transformed those places, when they came to Redlands, they embarked upon a similar endeavor. In 1890, they began construction of their winter homes on tracts of land at the southwest corner of Redlands, where Santa Mateo Canyon reaches the San Bernardino Valley. Eventually, the estate would be comprised of some 400 acres of land. Along the crest of the hill, with the canyon on the south, they built miles of roads and planted an incredible paradise they called Canyon Crest Park. Even though their estate was privately owned, they opened their park to anyone who wanted to visit. This literally put Redlands on the tourist map. So let's take a quick look at the park, which you can see in this aerial photograph from 1930. Here's the boundary of the property they owned. And these are the major points. There were three entrances to the park. Furthest west was the Crest Road entrance nearest the intersection of Cypress Avenue and Terracina Boulevard. The main entrance, because it was closest to town and the most southwest corner of the streetcar line, was called Glen Road and was near the intersection of Serpentine Drive and Highland Avenue. The third entrance was at the southeast corner of the park, where Crest Road met the intersection of Serpentine Drive and Sunset Drive. The brothers completely manufactured their landscape by grading for roads, which were designed to show vistas of the valley and canyon, and imported thousands of species and cultivars of trees, shrubs, and plants. And thanks to the water supplies created for Redlands by Frank Brown and others, they could watch their canvas grow and change. Each built a home. Here is Albert and Eliza Smiley's home at what would be the top of Sunnyside Avenue today. And Alfred and Rachel Smiley's home at the top of today's Drake Ridge Crest. But now let's take a trip into the park, starting at the entrance in the top right near Highland and Serpentine. Here's the scene that would have greeted you somewhere around 1910 on Glen Road. As you come in, you'd see a sign like this. Notice, private grounds, automobiles are not permitted in this park under penalty of law. Glen Road was beautiful as you came in. Eventually, you'd meet the intersection with Wynwood Road, 
but you'd probably follow Glenn uphill on the left. As you continued on, you'd eventually find yourself on Upland Road or Crest Road. And suddenly the vistas would make themselves manifest. Approaching Albert and Eliza's home from the east side, the plantings became more manicured and formal. The walk up to the home, lined with blooming flowers and lush vegetation, stunned visitors. You might even have come across AK with his clippers among his flowers. Here you can see all of the trees lining Crest Road right at the edge of the canyon. There were several notable spots along the way, like two reservoirs, which they named Mirror Lake and Geranium Lake. Thousands of postcards depicting the lakes were sent around the world and were a highlight for tourists. As you might imagine, the views were spectacular, and these small gazebos, which locals dubbed spooners, dotted their landscape to provide a place to rest and enjoy the beauty all around, whether it was overlooking the San Bernardino Valley or San Timoteo Canyon. In 1898, Mayor Fowler commented that the beauties of Canyon Crest Park have been praised these many years by appreciative tongues and many a sad heart has been brightened and many a thoughtful mind gained new inspiration. Children have danced in the sunlight and flowers and all have loved Redlands because of Smiley Heights. Not content only to provide the community with Canyon Crest Park, Albert K. Smiley also saw the need not only for a library, but for a public park. At the dedication of Smiley Park in 1898, AK remarked that, I noticed there was no place near the town accessible to the public where our citizens and the many strangers and health seekers that come hither could enjoy a quiet walk in the midst of trees, shrubs, and flowers which flourish in such abundance in variety in this splendid climate. Nearly two and a half years since, I began the purchase of lands for a park and have with much effort secured from 15 different parties a suitable tract near the heart of the city and have planted it with the choicest trees and shrubs that could be procured. This park will, I hope, in years to come adorn the city and bring comfort and health to those who are so fortunate as to settle in our midst. At the time of its dedication, Smiley Park stretched from Grant Street on the west to Cajon Street on the east. Of Smiley Park, Mayor Fowler said, a gift so full of beauty and blessings for the future, a beauty and blessing that will grow with the years that are to come. The park for beauty and pleasure where the weary and feeble stranger who may come here to this sunny land to regain health and where he may enjoy the quiet retreat and shade of the beautiful trees where the birds will sing their joyous notes of praise. Not only will the park be a pleasure and blessing to the stranger who may come to us, but to our own people, the poor as well as the rich may enjoy its beauties. In 1900, Albert and Eliza Smiley added yet another section to the park, creating Parkwood Drive with Grant Street on the east. So let's take a look at Smiley Park, beginning with the park entrance on Cajon Street next to City Hall. There's the YMCA City Hall building with the park entrance marked by the stonework on the right. Walking through the park toward 4th Street revealed the magnificent A.K. Smiley Public Library. 
At the intersection, turning around is the same section of the park, but looking northeast from 4th Street. A corner of the YMCA City Hall building peeks through the trees on the right. Southwest at 4th is, of course, Smiley Library. And we know this photo was taken after May 1903 because the bust memorializing President William McKinley is in its original location where the east end of the library's reference wing is today. Through the park to Eureka Street, looking back toward the library, the road continued through the park. And here we're at Eureka Street looking west with President McKinley in his second location, moved to make way for the library's first expansion. Barely visible in the far side of the image are the rooftops from houses on Grant Street. Today, you'd see the Redlands Bowl here. But early on, Albert Smiley envisioned this section of the park as a cactus and succulent garden and he imported diverse and rare species from all over the American Southwest and Mexico. Tourists especially enjoyed seeing the exotic plantings. Eventually, the section of Smiley Park between Eureka and Grant Streets was almost completely cleared to make way for the municipal amphitheater, later dubbed the Redlands Bowl. Let's take a quick look at the 1900 Park Edition, which created Parkwood. Smiley purchased this entire block at the same time he was assembling the other parcels for the park, but chose to hold off giving this section for two years. He designed the park and subdivided with new residential lots surrounding it. John P. Fisk, Redland's first real estate agent, also managed property for the Smiley Twins and was the official agent for the Smiley Edition. In early 1900, he was tasked with selling the residential lots and their location on the park was a prime selling point. In real estate, there is always healthy competition and even Redland's co-founder Ed Judson got into the frenzy advertising that he should represent buyers for lots in the new tract. More than 120 years later, Smiley Park is a testament to Albert Smiley's vision of a centrally located park for everyone to enjoy. Okay, hey, so now I will be talking about a couple of other great parks that we have in Redlands, beginning with Sylvan Park. So in January 1911, Redlanders voted to approve $80,000 in bonds for the creation of two new parks in the city, a playground on Lagonia and Orange Street, and a municipal park near the newly built University of Redlands. Within a few months, landscape architect Wilbur D. Cook of Los Angeles completed plans for the new park. Named for Sylvan Boulevard, Sylvan Park was designed to include a wading pool, children's play area, a picnic area, an amphitheater, and ponds. The park opened to the public the following year on May 11, 1912, with 2,000 people in attendance and including performances from the Redlands Municipal Band and other performers. You can see the program from the dedication here that is part of the library's collections. The Reverend, the Reverend Charles Blaisdell spoke at the dedication and described the park as a place where, quote, new friendships will be made, where old friendships will be renewed, and a place where all the people may come together and enjoy themselves. Sylvan Park became a popular destination for visitors to the city, including many photographers who were inspired by the park's beautiful vistas. Fortunately, many of those photographs have been donated to the Heritage Room over the years and are a wonderful resource that allow us to see the park that people knew a century ago. So using those photographs, let's take a tour of the original Sylvan Park. 
The park's footprint remains the same today as it was when it was constructed with Colton Boulevard north and University Street on the east. Many of the park's original trees were donated by various service clubs in the city, including the Elks Lodge, New England Society, University of Redlands, and the Contemporary Club. Within a few years, the park came to have 75 different varieties of trees, in addition to the beautiful flower gardens and gazebos. The North Lawn at the corner of University and Colton included two lily ponds. Surrounded by walkways and various flowers and trees, the lily ponds had water features at the center, creating a relaxing atmosphere for visitors to enjoy. A covered bridge was constructed to allow visitors to cross over the pond and have a break from the summer heat. Here you can see people spending time near the ponds in the 1920s. So it's one of several photographs in the collections uh, that show this area, giving the impression that the ponds were a popular destination. The ponds have been filled in, but the walkways that surround them are still there. So you can get idea, an idea of what it was like uh, when they were there in the past. Sylvan Park was also built with an amphitheater. Seen here at the park's dedication, the amphitheater included a covered bandstand and could accommodate quite a few people in the days before the construction of the Redlands Bowl. The picnic area was just south of the amphitheater. So you can see it there on the map. And here's a photo of it. So the shaded picnic grove became a popular destination too, for locals as well as for visitors to the city, particularly in the summer months when the trees provided a respite from warm temperatures. The photo you see here is of a picnic from the 1920s, and you can see the tall trees that give shade and really give you a sense of why it became a popular place for people uh, who visited the park when the weather was warm. The picnic areas remain in the same place today as they were when they were first built. A waiting pool and playground for the city's children was also included. These were features of special importance to the park's planners who sought to add more open space for the children of the city. A special ceremony was planned for this area of the park when it was open with games and performances by groups affiliated with the YMCA uh, and boys and girls playing a variety of sports. Here you can see some young visitors exploring one of the park's bridges that crossed over the Zangha. While it was not completed at the time of the park's dedication, the city planned to place boulders and other rocks and vegetation on the banks of the Zangha to protect it from erosion. By the early 1930s, the then park superintendent estimated that an average of 40 to 50,000 people, many from out of state, visited the park each summer. The park's South Lawn at University and Park Avenue remained unfinished at the park's dedication, with plans to expand the athletic amenities, including a swimming pool, basketball, tennis, and volleyball courts, as well as a baseball diamond. Soon, the South Lawn became the site of the park's bowling greens, um, and also the Sylvan Plunge, which was a public pool that was open in the summer months. Generations of Redlanders enjoyed the plunge as it was available for decades. Among the groups who donated trees when the park was constructed was the New England Society, who gave 15 trees to Sylvan Park and donated trees annually to various parks and schools in the city. The photographs you see here show the group as they planted trees at a couple of different sites in Redlands over the years. This photograph shows a group as they commemorate the planting of an elm tree in Smiley Park on Arbor Day, March 7, 1910. The tree is actually still alive 110 years after, after it was planted. And here you can see it today as it stands on the east side of the Lincoln Memorial Shrine. 
Like the New England Society, the Arboricultural Society of Southern California also contributed to Redmond's tree-lined views by planting a tree at the Triangle, a small park in the city center in November of 1915. Among the individuals present at this occasion was Jenny Davis, who was an early Redlands resident who worked to improve the city's aesthetics. She's pictured here on the left with the black hat. Jenny Davis is, of course, known to us today as the namesake of Jenny Davis Park on Redlands Boulevard. As some of you may know, the area where the park was constructed was not always as inviting as it is today. In fact, it was originally the city's dump, known as the glory hole, which you can see here. Used for waste as early as 1892, the site presented problems long before the plan to convert it into a park, with residents complaining about the smell for decades. In the 1930s, as car culture came to prevail, new highways began to more easily connect communities across the country. Redlands became a part of the new Highway 99 that connected Southern California. Constructed on what is now Redlands Boulevard, the highway was important to making Redlands accessible for tourism and commerce alike. Here you can see a map from the California Division of Highways detailing the new right-of-way that would approach the city from an angle to accommodate the Santa Fe and Southern Pacific Railroad lines seen at the top and bottom of the map here. For Redlanders, one hiccup in the highway's placement was that the first part of Redlands that travelers would see was the glory hole. So you can imagine why people wouldn't want that to be the first impression visitors would have of the city. Concerned groups lobbied the city to address the issue, particularly the Contemporary Club's Beautification Committee. The chairpersons of the Beautification Committee wrote, quote, when Highway 99 invaded Redlands, it cut across the map without benefit of landscaping. The new route offered a particularly fine vista of the 40-year-old city dump filled with every kind of debris. Members of the Beautification Committee urged upon state highway and landscape engineers and Redlands Councilmen, engineers and park department, the advantages of trees and shrubs or sidewalk strips adjacent to the highway. The group merged with the Redlands Horticultural and Improvement Society, members of the Chamber of Commerce and others to raise funds to reimagine the area into a park. The decision was made to convert the site into a public park. With the help of funding from the Works Progress Administration and through the work of the Contemporary Club's Unification Committee, the city began work on transforming the site into Jenny Davis Park. The first plants and trees were planted in 1937, which the Beautification Committee documented in the illustration you see here. As this article notes, Approximately 15,000 plantings were added to the site. The parkway across the highway also underwent cleanup efforts to ensure visitors could see the city at its best when first arriving. You can see it here with the railroad tracks that run parallel to today's Redlands Boulevard visible in the background. When it was completed, the area was transformed from this to a beautiful floral park. You could see it here shown about a year after it opened. It was named the Jenny Davis Memorial Botanical Park in honor of Jenny Davis's early beautification advocacy for the city. The beautification committee explained the naming decision by writing about the many contributions Jenny Davis made to Redlands, including her work to plant trees throughout the city her role in bringing well-known landscape architects to Redlands and her work with various organizations in town. In conclusion, they wrote, quote, Jenny Davis once said she had read that each person in a town can benefit that town if he will concentrate on one thing for that town. She concentrated in turn on trees, music, Red Cross, Indian affairs, and our hospitals, all to our advantage. The city was enriched by her coming here and by her enthusiasm. The group documented the transformation from the dump 
to a park in a film called The Glory Hole that was screened in Redlands in April 1941. Fortunately, a copy of the film was preserved and was donated to the Heritage Room a few years ago. Thanks to the Redlands Home Movie Preservation Project's digitization equipment, we were able to digitize that film and have it ready for you to watch today, possibly for the first time in many decades. Without further ado, here is the glory hole. One of the things that I really loved when we were watching this for the first time as it was being digitized is that it's all in color, which is really remarkable for beginning filming in the late 1930s and then into the very, very early 1940s, uh, especially at the end of the depression. The two co-chairs of the park were for the beautification committee of the uh, Contemporary Club were Belle Dibble and Edith Finlay. And we think this might be one of those two women. Unfortunately, it, it was a completely silent film and there was no script or anything like that that was left for it for us to totally understand what they're doing. But clearly, uh, this person is detailing what the transformation was. Um, so if anyone recognizes any of the people in this film, please do not hesitate to let us know. We should also mention that this is actually an abridged version of the entire film, um, just for time for this morning. But if you'd like to see the film in its entirety, just let us know here at the Heritage Room. Like Maria mentioned, WPA workers were brought in to build a lot of the stone parts of the park. And you can imagine the grading that had to be done uh, on top of all of the rubbish that had been buried there over the years. And then topsoil brought in by the truckload. You can see the big smudge oil tanks in the background there too that some of you may remember uh, just on the other side of Redlands Boulevard. There's some of that topsoil coming in now. Really beautiful spring day. This is really showing the transformation. So they started the plantings in 1937 and the work continued throughout uh, 1938 and then early into 1939. So you can see um, really how it did transform from what it was before. And the intention was for it to be a floral park and so that's what you saw in the illustration uh, that one of the women showed at the beginning of the video and also in the illustration that we showed in the presentation. Um, and then of course, and the, the plantings that they've selected. What's really interesting in this shot is you see the smudge oil tanks are still there in the background, but there are trees that have grown up in the meantime. And that was also a project of the Contemporary Club's Beautification Committee, because they don't, I don't think they wanted the, uh, tourists who are coming through Redlands to be faced with those massive smudge oil tanks. So they tried to shroud them with trees. You could definitely understand why when you see the, <laughs> the photos of the before and after. Here we've got a group of, I suspect, Boy Scouts uh, working on a project at the park. Maybe someone in the scene is watching. That's true, yeah. I mean, it's amazing to have this footage uh, in, in color like this.
this is showing more of those trees that were planted to obscure things that they didn't want people to see. This is a great little section because it runs down the highway and I, I think this is probably was to demonstrate the beautification community's work uh, hiding the, the railroad tracks and some of the other more industrial um, parts of the city there. So this is driving east and coming up to the intersection at Texas Street. Now we've backed up a little bit to around Alabama Street and we're going to do that run again. So you see some of the little hotels that had sprung up as a result of the creation of the highway. Coming up to Tennessee Street here. See the billboards coming into town. Now we're approaching New York Street, and you can see the Redlands neon sign that has recently been restored by the city right there on the right. And the park, of course, is sitting right below this. So crossing New York now. The Wigwag Crossing at Texas, which as a train person made me very excited to see. And then we're actually going to go a little bit into town, so you see the billboard for La Posada, uh, the hotel. And then actually coming in toward downtown. all the gas stations that was just I think that was my favorite part seeing seeing us coming into town here's a contemporary club picnic in the park with their spouses So this film would have originally have been shown with a uh, narration from one of the, the women who was involved in the project. So unfortunately, we don't have the script of what, what they said. Maybe they would have identified some of the people that were part of this picnic. This is just such a great document uh, that we're able to share, and that's a very exciting thing. We hope you enjoyed this look at some of Redland's earliest parks. To learn more, check out online exhibits focusing on parks and the city's historic observations of Arbor Day, which you can find on the Heritage Rooms webpage at www.akspl.org hr. Thank you for joining us for this commemoration of Earth Day.